How many of you have, have dogs or have had dogs in the past? All right. I was going to have the tech team show a video and I just kept forgetting about it. But how many of you have grandchildren or watch animated movies? All right. So those that raise your hand the second time probably have seen the movie Up. Up is about an elderly gentleman that floats his house over and all that. Well, there's a pack of dogs that are part of that storyline. And these pack of dogs are on mission. I can't remember that mission. Someone will certainly shout it out in a minute. But on their mission running and getting their instructions, something always happens when they're getting their instructions and they're on mission. What happens? Somebody that knows that movie. Squirrel. They're running along. If you've ever seen the movie or if you've ever had a dog, they're running along and all of a sudden squirrel. They've lost the instruction or lost sight of the mission. Squirrel. And you'll hear in our office, we use that sometimes that we're, we get sidetracked and going through different things in the day and all of a sudden squirrel. That squirrel could be anything in our day. And uh, from the snacks you guys leave from Sunday uh, to a different phone call or someone that comes in the office, squirrel. Well, I think in our, in our Christian walk, if you're sitting here today and you have a relationship with Jesus, as we're walking along, as we're getting God's instructions, as we're trying to serve him, live for him, I think from time to time, there's a squirrel in our life. And that's going to happen to all of us, the best of us. It's what we do with that that will strengthen us or weaken us in our walk. Today, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 6. As it uh, says in the bulletin there. And Nehemiah 6 is towards the end of the building of the wall. And actually, by this moment, the wall has now been built. Um, and this is the kind of the third wave of the exiles coming back to Jerusalem. And they're coming back. They're kind of, the wind has been taken out of their cells, the uh, temple destruction, and now the wall is still laying there undone. And we know the first couple of chapters, if you've been familiar with this passage at all, first couple of chapters of Nehemiah is, is him hearing the news of this wall that is still laying there and deciding what to do with it, talking to his boss, and finally getting a letter of, of transfer, for lack of better words, where he can walk through the land, and some of it not so welcoming land, to go and take care of his people, to take care of the wall. And then as the wall starts building, I love that passage in, in chapter 3, and it really ties in, if you're sticking around for Bible study, it really ties into the Bible study for today as well. That chapter 3 is where we see a wide array of people building the wall. Priests, who usually don't get their hands dirty. We see perfume makers. We see cousins. We see aunts and uncles. We see masons. But we see a wide array of people that God brought together for his purpose in building the wall. And then in chapter 4, we see a, a person come on board, San, San Ballot and his followers, to come and help. No? No. San Ballot comes to actually distract and comes to uh, thwart the project and wants to stop the project. And he does everything in his power to do that. But the resolve stands that we're going to remember that the Lord is great and he is awesome. That his projects are awesome. And then in chapter 5, there's kind of a sidestep in, in narrative anyway. There's a sidestep where you see Nehemiah helping those of need, those in need in a very unique way. They were being overtaxed and abused that way. And so Nehemiah got them to stop taxing or overtaxing those of need. And so he, he did that just as a gesture of it's not just about this project, but it's helping others as well to show God is still in control of all aspects of life. So now after all of that is happening, the wall is still being rebuilt. We come into chapter 6. And I'm reading out of NIV. Sorry, I didn't bring my CSB. When word came to send ballot, we know him as the one that wants to stop the project. Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not got a gap was left in it though up at, to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. 
I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. I love the resolve continued. Why should the work stop while we leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time gave me the same answer. Then the fifth time Samballot sent his aide to me with the same message and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written. It is reported among the nations and Geshem says it is true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have appointed prophets to make the, this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and will, it will not be completed. But I pray, now strengthen my hands. One day when I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Meshedtabel, who was to shut, who was shut in his home, he said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He had been hired to inti intimidate me so that, I would not, so that I would commit a sin by doing this and then would give me a bad name and discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Nodiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Lord, this is your word. May it be so continued on as I share these few words. May you be glorified. May our hearts be challenged. May our hearts be awakened to the possible distractions that might come our way and how we can handle them in a way that pleases you and doesn't succumb to what Satan wants us to do. We love you, Lord, and we look forward with great excitement and anticipation of what you are going to accomplish in our life this day. May we surrender to that. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the for first point there is distracting dangers Nehemiah faced that could have derailed him. <clears throat> so as, as we heard in the first couple of verses that the, the wall was now completed, just the doors needed to be re replaced. And, and if we've studied this enough that we understand these walls were not just a cinder block wall. I remember growing up around here, a cinder block wall was an, uh, a brick about 8 inches by about 16 inches or 12 inches or 16, depending on the block wall, and were pretty stout to carry. And if you still find them, they're still pretty stout to carry. I was helping my brother with a rental he has, and he had four of them in one of the back bedrooms by the renter. Those puppies were heavy. Um, but now that we've moved back, all these walls now are what I call fake cinder blocks. They look like cinder block. You're looking right at them. They have the same facial, but they're like three and a half inches thick. I mean, blow your house down idea thick. And so, but this was nothing like that. These walls could have been 18 to 22 feet, depending on who you understand. That's a thick wall. And these walls were being built or rebuilt. They were uh, scattered everywhere, fallen down, destroyed, and so they're being rebuilt. And if anyone's ever done a rebuild after destruction, that's probably the hardest starting point. It's easy to go in and take a wall down and put a wall back up, move it around and all that. But if you have something uh, from some version of destruction, you know that where do you start? And so now the, the wall has now been rebuilt and the door's not yet rehung, but you figure out the doors had to be um, at least 15 feet wide and these were thick, thick doors and very tall. They had not, been yet, they had not yet been hung, but they were going to be working on that and we'll see by the end of this how that was finished. But this frustrated 
Sand ballot. He thought earlier his, his intimidation factors were going to stop or slow down this process, and now the wall is finished. And first we see a plot to harm him. Uh, the enemies were now desperate, and yet they still held out hope that they, the project could be stopped. And we see there that uh, he understood, Nehemiah understood that four times he sent the message and four times he was trying to harm him, uh, that he understood that Sam Ballot was not just trying to meet with him. He wasn't just trying to uh, have a conversation. Let's negotiate. Yet he wanted to harm him. Um, and and the, the possibilities were great because the doors were not on, so there was no complete protection for them. And so they could have met and then they could have, uh, the, the goal probably was going to be, Sam Ballot wasn't any dummy. He was trained and a military man. So he was probably trying to get uh, Nehemiah to come away, the leader to come away. So that kind of leaves you open to no leadership. And then they would have sent another group of people in and taken over Jerusalem uh, to stop this rebuilding and to stop what he thought was going to be a revolt, or at least the story that he created. So there was a plot to harm him. And we, I don't think many of us walk through life with people looking to harm us per se, but we might've had situations in our life that there was. And I told a story down in the college group uh, months ago that years ago, we were getting ready for a mission trip and to Mexico. Uh, we were stationed, I was uh, serving up as an associate pastor in Salem, Oregon. We were going on a mission trip to Mexico to build a house. And so one of the parents uh, lent us his uh, Suburban, which was just a long family bus, okay? Uh, fit the whole family plus some. And so he lent, this to it, lent that to us the night before. I had to go pick up my daughter 40 miles away to go on the mission trip. On our way back, uh, I, there was a two-lane road. It was getting dusk, and this guy was coming in the lane heading head on. He was passing people in his lane, but he kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. So out of courtesy, I just flashed my lights once to say, hey, I'm here. Don't hit me. Well, he didn't like that. As I seen pass, and all of a sudden he whipped a U.E. behind me, pursued me for multiple times, tried to run me off the road a couple of times, stopped in the middle of the road, jumped out of his car, wanted me to stop. So I did enough to distract him, and then I floored it and got around him. Come up to the next stoplight. He wanted to harm us. He found us at a stoplight, got out of his car, hit the window, and I could see it bow in slowly and bow back. Then he kicked the door. The light changed. He ran off, never to see him again. So sometimes people want to harm us and distract us from doing God's will, but we have to stay resolved that his will needs to be done. His project needs to be done. Now, now, now this next point, the creation of false narrative, a false narrative, not to be political, just to add to this, this is kind of the first onset of fake news. And that's all you're going to get from me. But here we have Sam Ballot. Okay, so he wouldn't meet. So now he's going to uh, create uh, this this story, this storyline, in a fifth letter. Now, during that day, for someone to send a letter, and he said he sent four first, four letters to try to convince him to stop this project. Now, this being the fifth letter, fifth letter is now creating this false narrative. And it's interesting. They would send letters to the leaders, to the prophets, whoever was the leader, and they would have it folded and sealed. Well, this one says it was not sealed and it was open. The, per the reason for the personal one or the folded one, it was intended for me sending a letter to Ralph. Ralph's going to read it. He's going to understand it. And that's it. And that's what he did four times. This fifth one, open letter, it was now going to be observed by any and everybody that could read it. So in today's vernacular, it was the, the first four was Facebook instant messaging. All right. Only you and I can see that. Unless, of course, somebody breaks in and figures it out, but that's just an IT thing. Or now the fifth one is just Facebook post on a public, to the public. That's where this, second, this fifth letter went. And so he wanted everybody to understand it, everybody to read it, so that he could 
create this false narrative so that people would start panicking. If there is a panic in the people, then they would no longer support what Nehemiah is doing. If there's no more support, then the wall isn't finished. And now Samballat and his cronies can come in and take over and they can create the revolt that he thought that he was saying that Nehemiah was going to do. And I love the wisdom that he had. Um, that he did not bite. He says, I'm not going to follow your lead on this. Um, and that continues on to that uh, second point or the next point there, the plot to discredit uh, the false narrative in nine. And, and then, the, then the actual uh, that he wanted to discredit him, uh, the false narrative didn't work because he didn't go out to meet him and he didn't even listen to him. And so the next one was a plot to discredit him. And this is an interesting, he, there was this, moment that's that appeared to be good I, w I went to the house of shemaiah son of deliah the son of Mel Meshed, yes that one who was shut in his home he said let us meet in the house of god in his temple and let us close the temple doors because men were coming to kill you by the night they are coming to kill you that sounds like a great deal Let's go to the church. We're going to hang out. We're going to hide. We're going to turn the lights off and turn the alarm on so that if anyone comes in that we're going to be protected was this whole idea. But the discrediting part of this is it would have been wrong for Nehemiah. He was not a priest. All he would have to do is go in there and act like a priest and then he would have been discredited for what he was doing, that he was taking on the persona of a priest and that would not have set well with anybody in the nation of Israel. And so once again, God gave him such wisdom and discernment and vision that he could see what was happening that he was able to say, no, I can't do that. It's amazing when we go through life, if we're walking with the Lord and these squirrels show up to distract us, if we're truly walking with the Lord, then he's going to give us the wisdom and the discernment. He's going to give us the understanding what is truth and what is not. And that we, are, we can walk with our heads and hearts held high, that we can walk into the day that regardless if I have anybody with me or not, if I am living for the Lord and following His truth, He will be glorified. Amen? It's challenging at times, though. When you get a message, let's go to the temple, which sounds on the surface like a good idea. And we have that in our culture. Many, there's many great things or many good things out there that might be the distraction that keeps us from doing God's will. There, there's myriad of them. In the church setting, we might see something like, well, we've never done it that way before. No one's ever said that in this room. No one's ever heard that in this room. Accept us, world. Maybe the desire to be seen as in step with the worldly wisdom. Or maybe it's, it's a nice church. It's like a warm, comfortable sweater. Not that we can't be nice and not that we shouldn't be comfortable here at a, a church. But if that is all the reasoning that we are here, maybe we're missing something. Maybe we're getting used to it in our personal lives or as a church, getting used to what we do, uh, maybe not leaving room for God to do the work in us, through us, with us. Or if we go through the day not aiming at every, anything, guess what? We're going to hit it every time. We aim at nothing, we hit it every time. But if we set those goals personally as a Christian, that we're going to share our faith, that we're going to pray for the lost, we're going to uh, be a part of this uh, aspect of the ministry here at First Southern, or if you're visiting the ministry of your home church. But if we don't do that individually or corporately, we're missing the mark. God, use me today to share your, my faith is a simple and yet poignant prayer that all of us can do. And we might find it that we're sharing it across the cubicle at work or at the grocery store, wherever it may be. Maybe uh, sometimes we might get caught up in fudging on the truth to appear trendy. Or satisfy me syndrome keeping everybody happy becomes priority one 
instead of standing in the truth, living for the truth, sharing the truth, we can get caught up. I don't want anyone to think ill of me, so I got to be careful how I share this, when I share this, to whom I share this with. And so we have to realize that these dangers, these distractions are there, and they're not necessarily evil within themselves, but they can be and will be a distraction of fulfilling God's duty. And Nehemiah knew that very well. Yet we see in the second point, Nehemiah dealt with his, the distractions and how, what, how we must as well. First sub point there is he kept working. He kept going at what he needed to do. The wall kept going up even from the first time Sam Ballot jumped into the scene in chapter four. He kept going and kept cheering on and kept helping the wall get built. He did not stop. We, you and I have the same opportunity that as the distractions come, we have to stay so focused that we still go on. Um, uh, years ago, something horrible happened to my daughter uh, in her life, and it came to my uh, attention. And it was one of those frustrating, horrible moments that I didn't know what to do. Although I knew some things came to my mind, I wanted to take vengeance as mine saith Ken to play out the situation. And yet, praise the Lord, there was miles between this problem and, and God allowed me to stay focused. And it was a God thing. It was not a Ken thing. It was a God thing that he kept me in prayer. He kept me in his word. He kept me serving him so that within short time, the anger, the frustration uh, that overwhelmed me initially uh, fell away. But we have to stay working. We have, it's very easy when the storms come Let's just stay huddled down in the house and the world really won't miss me. But if you're part of the Bible study today, and I hope you can be, stick around. It's a great study on God needs everybody in his kingdom work. Amen? Then we see in, this, in that next one, his priorities and discernment was best out of verse 3. I want to reread this part. He sent his messengers to, to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? His priorities and discernment were spot on. He knew that God's work was great. He knew it had a reason. And he knew that this was going to be a distraction and possibly ending moment to the project. And so he stuck to his guns he had great discernment because god's work is great there was a whole lot that this could have distracted him sam ballot and his letters sam ballot and the undercurrent of threat that he could harm him yet he held to what god was leading him to he dealt with the distractions and we should as well, that we should be prepared that as you and I live for the Lord, Satan is going to love to distract you. He's going to love to distract you. And so we have to be resolved going into living for the Lord, that we have to be resolved that we have to live by the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us and equips us to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or imagine. And that's not because of who we are, but who God's power, who God is in us and his power acting through us, that we can accomplish that. This next sub point, his response was courageous. Nehemiah had courage, but it was God's courage. I can do all things through Christ who... We have to live in that reality, whether in that context and or in the principle of that context of that very passage that you and I can, if we're living for the Lord, we get to live in God's power, not our own. So when we come to the distractions, albeit very horrific or very uh, small, that we need to make sure that we're living in God's power. And then and only then we can move forward like Nehemiah did with courage with boldness, with assurance, with our hearts and heads held high in such a way that the world wants what we have. And we have to trust that. What's happened in the last few days in Syria 
is historical at best. We know that. Whatever side of that reality is that you're on, I'm not here to take one side or the other, but we have to trust that even that, whether it's good or bad, resolve is great or, or horrible, that we have to trust that God is still in control and we should still serve him and not get distracted by the news clip. Amen? Because we could sit there with CNN and, and just repeat it every 27 minutes. They'll want you to. Or Fox News or whoever we pick. And the danger of that is we become so cynical and distracted that we're forgetting that we have to love our enemy. Are you kidding me? Even spelt S-Y-R-I-A? Yep. But we can only do that when we're surrendered to God's power as Nehemiah was. And so we can pray for our enemies. We can love our enemies. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit that we're not distracted in moments such as this. In verse 9, they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get the work done, or, or the hands will get too weak to work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. He asked, this is the last sub point there, he asked for strength. Too often we get going in a day, and we just know we can do it. We've been trained, uh, we've been equipped, uh, we, we've done everything, but sometimes it's worth right in the middle. God, give me strength. Because the distraction might be, I'm doing it my own power. And so Nehemiah trusted uh, that, that it was God and God alone that was going to give him the strength, and so he prayed for it. He knew that if he couldn't do it alone, he asked God for the strength to keep him from giving in to the distractions that threatened him. God can keep us from being distracted from his purpose for, as individuals or as a church, but it takes an individual and it takes a church to stay resolved and focused on God and God's plan, God and God's power. As a passage uh, read earlier uh, out of Ephesians, exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or imagine. I love this. So it was completed. The wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. What should have taken months, if not years, to rebuild, God did it in 52 days. That probably had to even surprise Nehemiah as he first saw the rubble laying there. Imagine that. We've seen enough footage of the rubble around the world that it has been bombed by us or others. And so we know what rubble looks like. They were dealing with rubble all over the place to say at the day one, well, my calculations say that it should take between 50 and 54 days. And if we really work hard, we should get it done less. No, I'm sure his humanness was there and saying, well, we're just going to keep going until it's done. And as he did not allow the distractions to get him, to allow Sambala to get him distracted and away from the site, to, uh, to harm him, he stayed focused on the word of God and on word God's desire for uh, Israel, for the Jews of that time. And that he had to rebuild this wall. And it was more than just rebuilding a wall as much as it was physically that. It was rebuilding the spirit of a nation. When we'd go to these mission trips down to Mexico, I, was, we, we went, I went on seven of them. And what's, nice, what's exciting about that, the team that goes down, we had a team that was praying and helping put together things while we're in Salem. And then you go down and you build with 15, 16, 17 people and four days a house is built. And it's not just that you provided a house. You built up a team that saw what it meant to surrender to God daily because by day two, you were so sore, so tired, possibly sunburned, and the last thing you want to do is get up at six o'clock in the morning and work for the Lord. But you did. And it was the reward is insurmountable because as you're doing it and you're seeing how God is making this happen and giving you strength and giving you power, and then by Thursday at noon or so, you're handing over the keys to the family, tears just coming down everybody because there's such joy in what God accomplished. That's what it means to stick to our guns with ne as Nehemiah did. We need to stay focused on what God has in mind, no matter the distractions, no matter the challenges. But you're sitting here today and you might be saying, but pastor, it's so hard to do that. I can't. You're exactly right. I love when people say that because we can't. 
It's only by a life that is surrendered to Jesus Christ, a life that is surrendered to the Holy Spirit daily, that it can accomplish God's will without distraction. And if you're sitting here today, uh, my encouragement is for you, if you're sitting here and you don't have a relationship with God through surrendering your life to his son, Jesus, who died on the cross for you because he loved you that much, all you have to do is that you have to admit you're a sinner. We all are sinners, pastors included. Thank you, Doris, for not saying amen. But we're all sinners, and if we had come to a humble place and admit that, and then that we believe that God loved us enough to send his son to die on the cross for me and my sins, you and your sins, and that we confess him as Lord and confess our sins, wanting to surrender our lives to him, if you are willing and able to do that today in very simplistic prayer form, then today you will be a child of God, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, so that you too can walk through today without the distractions pulling you away from God's purpose. Amen? That's what it takes. It's his power, not ours. Nehemiah realized that. He had to go through some rough times. Distractions can be very intimidating. Distractions can be distracting. That's why they call them that. But where are you at today? Are you feeling that the world is pulling at your distraction, pulling at your focus? It could be something as good as family even, distracting. It could be something as great or good as a spouse, great or good as a job. It could be something horrible as a real enemy. What we have to do is we have to come to a place and say, God, I need your strength like Nehemiah did. And he even prayed for Samballot. Remember Tobiah, Samballot, and Samballot, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Nodiah. He wanted justice, he prayed for justice. But he did it in God's strength, not his. And that's our resolve, that if we surrender to him, we can do this in his strength in such a way that the wall gets built in 52 days, in such a way that things happen and, and it doesn't make sense. Whatever that might be, but God can do it exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or imagine. So today, we don't have to get squirreled in our faith. They're out there and they're one to distract us. But we need to resolve that we can have victory in distractions. Lord, we do thank you for this passage of scripture that reminds us that we are never alone as we surrender to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would just help each one of us to claim you as our Savior. That today would be a day that we resolve to go in your strength. We may have even arrived this morning almost robot-like in our own strength, allowing our, our bodies and our ailments to distract us, allowing news to distract us, allowing the list can go on. But maybe at this moment, Lord, we'll say, okay, I'm done. I don't want to do it in my strength. Give me your strength, Lord. Be with each one of us that we can resolve for that. And Lord, for that person that's sitting here that may have been around church in and out of their lives, may have been members of different churches in and through their lives, or never been in a church. But today, Lord, they heard that, that they can have power and strength to get through distractions and live for you regardless. I pray for that person that has never surrendered their life to you. That today they could admit that they're a sinner, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if they confess with their mouth that you were sent to the cross and died for our sins, that they confess that with their mouth that they will be saved, that today will be the day they, they believe and confess you as Lord and Savior and confess their sins, that today will be the day of victory. Lifetime victory. So be with that person today, Lord, that they can make a decision for you. We love you, Lord, and we just look forward to what you're going to accomplish in and through each one of us. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are in our lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.